this next session, you'll see Alan Titchmarsh. If you enjoy the session, take a selfie and share your digital festival experience on our Facebook, Twitter or Instagram accounts to encourage your friends to join in too. So now, please give a virtual welcome to Alan Titchmarsh. I'm Alan Titchmarsh, known to many people as a gardener, to other people as a television presenter, um, and I tend to do all kinds of bits and bobs. It's been an interesting life, having left school at 15 with one O level, which I suppose this year is perhaps more than many students have attained, thanks to the local difficulty. Sorry, don't joke, Alan, it's very serious. Uh, but I managed, somehow at 15, to get a job as an apprentice in a local parks department, and I always wanted to be a gardener. I worked my way through my apprenticeship, through college and the studentship at Kew Gardens, eventually taught there, and then went into journalism, first as a gardening books editor, and then as deputy editor of, of a gardening magazine. It was while I was there doing that that I started doing radio and television as a, as a gardening expert, first of all, and at the very end of the 70s, I decided to go freelance, live off my wits and what wit I had by writing, by broadcasting, and it's been a colourful career over all those years, more than 40 of them now in broadcasting, everything from Chelsea Flower Show and Songs of Praise to nowadays Love Your Garden, um, and a brand new series starting on Sunday mornings on ITV called Love Your Weekend, which is a celebration of countryside, the people who live in it, the people who work at it, and everything from stained glass window making to stone carving, thatching. It struck me that on Sunday mornings the choice is either politics or cooking. And as somebody who has only a vague interest in both those things, it seemed to me that two hours, would you believe, of country matters on a Sunday morning would be a nice alternative to politics and cooking. So, Love Your Weekend starts on 6th of September and I'm looking forward to it running for a good 10 weeks and we'll see what happens after that. I've been writing for a living since the mid-1970s when I started life as a gardening books editor. And the, the boss, the, the editor, I was an assistant editor, suddenly found that somebody he'd booked to write a book was no longer able to do it. And he said, well, instead of editing, he said, do you mind writing one as well? So my first gardening book was written in the, the late 1970s, and I've been at it ever since. Um, I've also written 11 novels. I have another one to write this winter, so if anybody has any ideas, I'd be very grateful. People always say, where do you get your ideas from? I said, well, I have this cupboard marked ideas, and I open it up, and I'll just pluck one. I have no idea. And the trouble is, you do worry that every novel will be the last one you ever wrote. I remember on oh, my third novel, um, I was in Manchester doing a, a literary lunch, and the young cub reporter from the local paper came up and he said, oh, he said, third novel then? So I said, yes, he said, that, that, that's the difficult one, the third one, isn't it? I said, well, they're all a bit tricky. Why do you say the third one's more difficult than the others? He said, well, he said, uh, first one they'll buy to see if you can do it. Second one, they'll buy to see if first one were a fluke. Third one, you're on your own. So I can't tell you what it feels like when you've just done your 11th and you're about to do your 12th. You feel very much on your own then. Um, but aside from writing gardening books and, and fiction, I dabbled over the years with poetry. I, I, I suppose I started as a child, really, writing silly little rhyming verses. Some people would say I hadn't come on at all. Uh, but then a few years ago, I wrote a book called Fill My Stocking, which was a Christmas anthology, because I, at home, every Christmas, we put on an entertainment for friends. We have a, a barn in which we can fit about 60 seats, and we have a tiny stage at one end, and we do this little Christmas entertainment. And I started writing poems and verse for that, and also for Christmas concerts that I get invited to do every year in cathedrals and churches and concert halls. It's, it is wonderful, you know, sitting in the middle of the CBSO, the City of Birmingham Symphony Orchestra, and reading poems in between their big choral extravaganzas. I love doing that. And I found after I've done it for a few years, and I've been doing it now for about 30-odd, that I was repeating material and that a lot of Christmas writings don't read out loud very well. So 
I decided I'd start writing Christmas poems myself. Uh, and I did, and I used them, and they seemed to go down well. So then we did this little book called uh, Fill My Stocking. A lot of the material was mine, but not all of it. And then about two years ago, a lovely composer called Debbie Wiseman, who I met through Classic FM, for those of you who listen to me on a Saturday morning while you're getting up on Classic FM, I can only apologise and hope you enjoy the music more than you enjoy me speaking in between it. But I met Debbie through that, and she said, you write poetry, don't you? And I said, well, yes, I do a bit. And she said, we should work together. She said, you should write poems about plants and flowers and trees, um, and I'll write a piece of music to accompany each of, say, a dozen pieces. So I wrote poems about sweet pea and the cedar tree and myrtle and... We put them together, uh, a piece of music and a poem. We, we did an album together called The Glorious Garden, which, even before it came out, went to number one in the classical charts. So I'd just like to boast to you that not only have I been in the classical charts, we were actually number 30 in the pop charts for a week. So I can add pop singer, not quite. I read the verses in between Debbie's pieces of music. Uh, but that sort of got me my juices going again with poetry. And having done those sort of 12 poems, I quite fancied doing some more. And so my publisher, Hodder, said to me, well, why don't you write some more and we'll see if we can put them in a little book. And they did. And that little book is called Marigolds, Myrtle and Moles. Now, the thing about writing poetry is it is terribly subjective, You'll have some people who love it, but equally, you'll have people who absolutely loathe it and say, well, there's no way he's going to be poet laureate, is there? I'm always reminded of the words, and I can only paraphrase them, of Salman Rushdie, who said, well, <clears throat> if you don't like my book, go away and write your own. So that's all I can say to you, really, is if you don't like my poetry, pass the book on to someone who might, uh, but go away and write your own. I do find writing poetry therapeutic. Again, like the novels, no idea where the ideas come from, except that if I'm inspired by a particular flower, I will write about that. Um, some of them are, I hope, funny. Some of them are short, some of them are longer. They all, um, I hope, demonstrate a profound love of the natural world, of nature, our responsibility to the landscape, which isn't an onerous one. It's, from my point of view, a delight to have been, as I see it, put on this earth to leave it in better shape when I shuffle off my mortal coil than it was when I arrived. And I don't mean that in a grand way, other than looking after the piece of earth that I've been allowed to become a steward of, a custodian of, for the length of my time on earth. For most of us, that's a tiny garden. For some, it's a flower pot or two. For others, it's stately acres. It doesn't matter which it is. For me, that is the greatest truth, the greatest reality. That piece of earth, what you do with it, and whether you discharge your responsibilities as someone who lives on it and off it well, or whether you squander them during your lifetime. And I sit down and watch the news every night with increasing despair tending more and more to watch just the headlines and then turn it off, rather than listen to the latest lot of doom and gloom worldwide that's being purveyed for my delectation and delight and endeavouring to make me responsible for the entire worries of the planet. Now, I don't know everything about evolution, but I do know that people like Darwin studied things like the earthworm and worked out about the evolution of mankind and the human brain. And I do know, or feel quite definitely, that within a hundred years you cannot mentally become responsible and have the capacity to deal with the worries of the world when only a century ago you were expected to deal with no more than the worries of your village. There you are. That's the end of my sermon. But I do think that I can make a difference by encouraging people to cherish that little piece of earth outside their back door and do something with that, rather than just feeling depressed by the weight and the worries of the world that they feel powerless to do anything by. And life as well as responsibility for landscape, life needs confetti, it needs amusement, it needs jollity. 
Uh, it needs uplift. And I like to think that the poems I've written in Marigold's Myrtle and Moles, as well as making sure that people feel responsible for the earth and get the joy out of it that I do, might also bring a chuckle. It was my editor who decided on the title because she said, um, I've got written poems about Marigold's and Myrtle and Moles uh, within the book. She thought it ran off the tongue nicely. And Marigold's is the only one which I remember in its entirety off by heart. And it is, in a way, the most frivolous and facetious of all of them. Uh, and the thing about marigolds is they're orange. Not everybody likes them. They're not nearly classy enough. So I, I wrote this poem from the marigolds' standpoint. Common, yeah, some do say that. My accent is a pain. I drop me H's and me T's. Can't say the rain in spine. But when it comes to colour, oh, I've got it by the bucket. And if you don't like orange flowers, all I can say is, what a shame. So people worry when I get to the end of that poem. The, the first one I wrote, um, I, I wrote on a train journey. Um, I live here on the Isle of Wight, but I also live in, in Hampshire. Um, and my own station, is, my local station, is Alton. And it's a one-hour, ten-minute journey into Waterloo. And I sat on the train one day and this germ came into my mind. So I, I sat down with my iPhone and I wrote this, which I finished as we pulled in to Waterloo Station. And it encompasses all those things I've been talking about, about responsibility for landscape, but the joy of it and also the need to make children aware of their legacy and their responsibility. It's called Why Does the Willow Weep? Why does the willow weep, Papa? asked the girl with the golden hair. Why do its branches brush the ground and why are its stems so bare? It weeps for the folly of humankind, said her father with aspect grave. Its tears fill the streams and the rivers and seas at the actions of maiden and knave. And the absence of leaves, she persisted, there are none on its branches today. No, in autumn they yellow and wither and fall, then they lie on the ground and decay. Will they ever return? asked the daughter. Has the tree given up now and died? Her father looked down at her, then shook his head. It is warning us gently, he sighed, a reminder that nothing's forever, that each living thing has its time. But with spring you will notice its leaves will return, and under its branches we'll dine, as we did last summer and the summer before, as the daisies push up from the lawn, and Mamma will make biscuits and iced lemonade, as she's done since the day you were born. So... All will be well then, as soon as it's spring, asked the girl with the golden hair, for the king and the queen and the prince and princess, and the boy with the pretty grey mare. Yes, all will be well, said the father. There'll be leaves here from May to September, but the king and the queen and the boy with the mare would do well now to pause and remember that nature is kindly and weathers the storm, at least in our lifetime so far. But one day, if we take her for granted too much, she may look on our world and say, ah, these people I shelter and cradle and shade give no thought to the oncoming years, and her branches once more will sweep down to the ground, and the rivers fill up with her tears. And then, in the spring, no new leaves will appear, and her wood will turn ashen and brittle. No birds will be singing. No daisies will flower. Because people cared just too little. There were tears in the eyes of the golden-haired girl at the thought of a world with no trees, with no singing birds and no daisies below, no butterflies, beetles or bees. Her father smiled down at her, ruffled her curls and said, Promise you'll never forget to take care of all nature as it cares for you. 
Only then will your future be set on a course that is likely to favour the land and the creatures who on it depend. Only then will you know in your mind and your heart that we have not hastened the end of a world filled with wonder and wild things and love which will make sure that this beauty we keep and the flowers will bloom and the birds they will sing and the willow will no longer weep. We will not forget, said the golden-haired girl as she gazed on the towering tree. We will care for the future, the king and the queen and the boy with the mare, oh, and me. It seemed a way of expressing our responsibility, but also handing on that responsibility to the young so that they could enjoy it. I sent this book to somebody um, very famous, I'm not going to say who, and he um, wrote back to me and said it's lovely, and, and, and he said the thing I loved most, he said, were the letters that you had from viewers all those years ago. And I said, oh, thank you very much. That's the only part of the book I didn't write. <laughs> but there are some, <laughs> some very full letters. Dear Mr. Ditchmarsh, I thought you might like to see how far-reaching your influence is becoming. My niece Emma will be four in January. She's recently begun attending preschool every afternoon where she's been starting to learn about God. The first afternoon the subject was introduced, she didn't seem too sure about the whole concept. She listened as the teacher explained how God had created the world. But when the teacher said that God created the plants and the trees, she said, no, that's Alan Titchmarsh. So I'm terribly sorry that I got blamed for that. Um, dear sir, two questions. What was the mixture you were adding Cointreau to? And please may I have the recipe for your pancakes? I don't know who that was meant for, but the one I treasure most is when I first went on Nationwide and I had uh, this little letter, it said, from a nine-year-old boy. Why does Alan Titchmarsh always have clean hands and boots? I did explain to them. My mother always told me when I came home from work to wash, and, and so I, I, I do wash um, regularly. Um, I muse from time to time on, on why I'm here. And I think, really, um, I've expressed to you my feelings on, on why I'm here. There, there is one poem called A Place in History, which I won't read. I'm going to leave that one to you to read, because one does muse as to if there is a reason why we're here and why we do it. And it's not just gardens that enrapture me and capture my interest. I, I grew up in Ilkley in the Yorkshire Dales, uh, joined the Wharfdale Naturalist Society, age eight, and I'm still a member. Uh, all these years on. And wildflowers, for me, uh, are something to be treasured. The only prize I ever got in junior school was for pressed and dried wildflowers in an album. And uh, I still have that album that I made when I was about eight years old. And the flowers are crisp and dry, but still every bit as fresh in their crisp and dry state as they were when I stuck them onto the pages of grey, rough paper with stamp hinges and wrote underneath them in my spidery script their common names. Geoffrey Grigson wrote a book called The Englishman's Flora, which explored the different common names for British wildflowers all over the country, county by county. They're very romantic and for me they encapsulate the magic and wonder of wildflowers. So I wrote this piece called Wild Beauty. Campion, goat's beard, meadow rue. All of these I offer you, along with poppy, meadow sweet, and ladies' bed straw at your feet. Brush your way through honeysuckle, old man's beard, and then with luckle come along a clearing paved with violet, celandine, and waved with plumes of willow herb and sallow, clumps of gorse and mounds of mallow. Drown yourself in Yorkshire fog and gaze on sun you sprung from bog. Walk the woodland through the clouds of flowering may and beechwood shrouds to breathe in tang of spruce and pine and catch your sleeves on eglantine. By riverbed and stream and beck, 
Neath willow wands and reed mace, check that water blobs, bog bean, lily, all survive. I'm not being silly. For if we fail to see them bloom, then surely soon a time will come when each and every British flower, each climbing plant upon its bower, and every orchid, sedge and rush, each moss and fern, each tree and bush, will wither for the want of care, since... No one noticed they were there, or even worse, were smothered under concrete thanks to lack of wonder. Our world would be all the poorer without our precious British flora. Gather ye rosebuds, if ye must, but never give your love to just the cultivated trees and flowers, for nature's blooms are rightly ours to cherish and to then hand on to generations when we're gone. Watch them, love them, serve them well. Burdock, daisy, pimpernel, bluebell, nettle, Queen Anne's lace, each one here deserves its place. Let them thrive and drop their seeds, and never call them dreadful weeds. For weeds are just a man's invention, thwarting now his best intention. Find a spot to show their worth, like you they own a place on earth. You will find this book shot through with messages, I suppose, the one main message being the joy that wildflowers and cultivated gardens have given to me all my life and the responsibility that, as I explained, I feel for a patch of ground. But it's also joy and love that I want to pass on and to encourage people to find that stimulation and and sheer pleasure that I get out of growing plants even though it is coupled with frustration. And for making gardens for other people, which can, I know, change lives. Lockdown has been interesting from that point of view, and salutary for a lot of people, I think, who've probably neglected that piece of earth outside their house, but found when they were confined to barracks for all those weeks and months that it offers solace, it offers a sense of perspective, a sense of proportion, and the chance to be at one with nature and watch it develop every day through spring, summer, autumn and winter and to see its daily changes rather than just coming back once a week and saying, oh, so-and-so's come into flower. It also opens our eyes to everything that lives there, that has its place in the garden, not just the pretty things like hedgehogs and song thrushes and robins, but the insects without which our entire civilization would crumble. Honeybees and even wasps, you know, wasps eat green fly and caterpillars. They're really quite useful, instead of which we just keep batting them off like that. I, I did do one on wasps, you'll find that. Um, but you'll also find, I'm going to read one last poem, and I want to do a, a funny one, really, to, to finish off with. Shall I do the wasp? I think perhaps I will. With calamine my skin anoint, and tell me please, what is the point of wasps? They gorge themselves upon my plums, they sting my children on their bums. Ow, wasps! I watch them chew my garden bench, my eyes screw up, my buttocks clench at wasps. They cause my visitors alarm, as they repel with flailing arm the wasps. You ask, O death, where is thy sting? It's in the rear end of that thing, that wasp. Summer picnics are a farce because that thing there in their bottom. Damn wasps. I try to swat them, try to clout them. Life would be so nice without them, wasps. Remember, every little creature is a worthy garden creature. Every little creature that is except that yellow stripy insect which has the capacity to completely ruin an otherwise perfectly blissful summer afternoon in my garden by buzzing around theirs of my guests and driving them to distraction. We're forced to go indoors to get away from them. Ah! Wasps. Marigolds, myrtle and moles, a peon of literature justifying the garden, encouraging everybody to go out there and do it, but also sometimes to sit down and just to look at it. Without gardens, where would we be? They are, if you like, the figurehead of conservation and environmental care. They are that naked lady at the front of the ship with her bosoms exposed, heading off into the future with all of nature behind her.
that little figurehead called the garden and the person who tends it, the gardener. They should be really rather more revered than they are. And I hope you will join their number. Enjoy yourselves. Our thanks to Alan Titchmarsh. Thank you very much for participating in the Red Funnel Isle of Wight Digital Literary Festival. If you've enjoyed this presentation, please consider making a donation. Follow the Donate Now button from the homepage of our website. You can also benefit from great discounts by ordering via Blackwell's Bookshop from our homepage. We'd like to thank the loyal sponsors who've supported the Isle of Wight Literary Festival over the past years. Without their financial contribution, it would be difficult to attract the many wonderful speakers we've hosted while keeping ticket prices down. This year, their support has enabled us to provide the digital festival free of charge. Special thanks to Red Funnel, who've been our title sponsor for many years and, as well as providing financial support, offer a warm welcome to speakers and visitors to the island for the festival.